You're listening to Dakota Spotlight. My name is James Walner. This is episode six of The Mandan Murders. A mass murderer remains on the run. Four people were found dead inside a property management company. And then we got a call that they wanted us to go down to the police station. The victims have been identified as Robert Faulkner, age 52, Adam Fuhr, age 42, Lois Cobb, age 45, and William Cobb, age 50. When I heard that, I just, I dropped, and I was in my kitchen, I dropped to my knees. You know, my first thoughts were like, how am I going to do this? Overwhelmed in disbelief, like I didn't know how to even move. And then from there, we got to figure, okay, where does it go from here? Being able to have somebody arrested and charged within like a matter of three days, that was huge. Chad Isaac is being ordered to serve four consecutive life sentences in prison, one for each of the people he killed. A man convicted of killing four people in Mandan three years ago is dead from self-inflicted injuries. In recent episodes, we've been focusing a lot on the crime, the investigation, apprehension and arrest of Chad Isaac, and all the evidence against him. This week, we're going to do something else. We're going to get to know Bill and Lois Cobb a little better. We'll meet some of their family and loved ones and learn more about who Bill and Lois were. We will also learn a bit about how their loved ones have coped with all of this during the last four years, and they even offer some words of wisdom or advice for others who may have to go through something similar. I want to make sure I thank RJR and the Cobb family for helping me get a hold of some video that you'll be hearing about in this episode. Bill Cobb was once an Elvis Presley impersonator, and I was fortunate enough to get some footage from some of his shows back in the mid-2000s. You'll hear some of that, too, in this episode. Again, thanks to the folks at RJR and the Cobb family for allowing me to use the audio. Now, let's get to know Bill and Lois Cobb a little better. Jackie Faulkner, wife of Robert Faulkner and owner of RJR, told me that Bill Cobb had a goofy side, a loving side, and a tough side. He was well respected by the employees out in the shop. In fact, Jackie referred to him as a powerhouse, said he was military all the way through, very structured. But also, the guy made people laugh every single day. I would learn that a lot of people at RJR had that same view of Bill Cobb. Bill Cobb was a character and a man of many hats and talents and skills. This is Ben Pace, an employee at RJR. On a work side, Bill was unmatched when it came to work ethic and understanding things and getting things done that you need. On a personal side of Bill, he was like a giant goofball. One of my favorite to toy and mess around with. Ben Pace told me that he and Bill used to play pranks on one another, give each other a hard time in a loving way. Very straight point to the point, blunt and soft and teddy bear-like at the same time. And I felt like Bill was one of those people that always had your back as well. Bill, I couldn't say enough good things about. I felt like Bill was like one of those uncle figures that you could just have a good time with, but you could always rely on as a human being. Bill Cobb was a huge, huge Elvis Presley fan. In fact, in the mid-2000s, Bill Cobb did Elvis Presley impersonations on stage. When Ben Pace caught wind of this while working at RJR, he couldn't resist the temptation to give Bill a hard time about it. You know, tease him a bit. Google searched his old Elvis impressions and found a video of it. Copied the video and then played it when Bill came into work one morning. (laughs) In fact, here is a snippet from that video. This is Bill Cobb's voice during his Elvis show. Me. 
Yeah, oh yeah, my dad was an avid Elvis fan. This is Amy Cobb again, Bill's daughter. She lives in Springfield, Illinois. My dad um, was born in Missouri, um, and he has a brother and two sisters. One of his sisters passed away, but he um, lived with his grandparents and his brother. And then I don't know exactly what age he ended up moving to Springfield, but he was really close with his grandparents, especially his grandpa. His grandpa is, I think, where he got his love for Elvis. Um, And then he moved to Springfield, I want to say, when he was like 15 or 16. He moved here with um, his aunt and uncle. And then... As far as I know, he was here pretty much the whole time. I don't think he ever moved back to Missouri. And then he always stayed really close with his brother. I don't think that he really had much of a relationship with his sisters, though. Um, But that's just because of their childhood dynamic with their parents. I don't really know much about um, his father. I only met him twice and then his mom I, I never met so they d- I would say had a little bit more of a rough childhood but they overcame that I asked Amy what some of her most prominent memories of her dad were from her childhood once again Elvis Presley was part of it this time on Sunday morning the Cobbs didn't go to church really but Bill Cobb had his own Sunday morning routine for himself and for his family On Sundays when we would wake up, my dad would call it his church, and we would listen to Elvis Gospel, and it was so loud through the whole house, Um, and he would just be making breakfast, Um, and that was, I just remember that was almost every Sunday when I was younger. That was like a normal thing that we woke up to every Sunday, and then usually we would like do our chores and clean, and then we would all kind of go about doing our own things, but it was definitely something I remember every Sunday. To this day, for Amy, the music of Elvis Presley remains a fond memory for her. Oh, I love Elvis. I am definitely the child that took uh, the love for Elvis. Um, Probably not to the extreme of my father, but um, it was definitely, I mean, any car ride we went on, we listened to Elvis. Mostly my dad singing Elvis the whole time, but um, he then later, and when I was a little bit older, I was still pretty young. I was in elementary school. He was an Elvis impersonator. So, yeah, so I got to be his um, teddy bear girl or scarf girl. I still listen to Elvis all the time. In fact, thanks to Ben Pace and RJR, I got hold of that video of Bill Cobb doing his Elvis show. And right there on stage is Amy Cobb, his scarf girl. If you'd like to see this video, check out the links in the show notes. In 1987, at the age of 19, Bill Cobb joined the U.S. Army. Bill was stationed in Germany, and joining him there was his first wife, Lisa Henderson. When they returned to the U.S. and Illinois, they had two kids, first a son, Tyler, and then Amy. This marriage did not prevail, however. The couple separated and eventually divorced. Bill and Lois met in 2008, and Bill proposed to her on the steps of Graceland, the home of Elvis Presley. They were married in 2010. And so, who was Bill Cobb, according to his daughter, Amy? He, I always, like, thought of him as, like, a a teddy bear. He, but, like, on the outside, he seemed, like, really stern to everybody. (laughs) He was definitely a tough love kind of guy, um, but he always joked. He, I, if you talk to anybody, he always, that's like, that was his thing. He made jokes about everything. <laughs> he was always, I feel like a pretty genuine person, but he was always super straightforward. He was just direct and he, <laughs> he, he told it how it was or how he felt it was. My dad and I had a great relationship, but just not as great as it was when I got older. You know what I'm saying? I saw I had a different perspective on things like his views and values, those kinds of things. Um, 
as I got older, I realized, you know, as far as um, he just wanted to work hard for uh, like a, a humbling life. You know what I mean? Like they just, both him and my stepmom, they worked very hard to manage their money and like things that maybe weren't instilled in them when they were younger and they had to change as they were older. They they just wanted like a simple but happy life, you know, like those were the things that were important to them. Like uh, the kids, they were important to them. They had a dog that was by far <laughs> very important to them. <laughs> Her name was Presley. And so that was their baby because we were all grown up and older. And so that was, she was really important to them. Um, I just think like, just honestly, like them having a simple life was just simple, happy. That's, that was what was important to them, especially as they were, they weren't old, but as they were getting older. I remember the last time that my dad and stepmom came to visit Springfield um, was in 2018 and they stayed at a hotel here and I just remember it was probably like the first time like as an adult that I just remember not that I didn't talk on the phone with my dad because I did but you know obviously face-to-face conversations are different and so I just remember like he actually I would say opened up to me more about like his life and like when we were growing up and um, like my parents separating and just the things that we had never really talked about before so I just remember like at that moment I felt like a different connection with my dad than I had before I don't know it was more just a more personal conversation than I felt like I ever had with my dad which was definitely something that was necessary and then I would say the other conversation that really sticks out to me was actually the last time that I saw them and that was when I went to visit them in North Dakota and um, at this time in my life I had decided that I didn't have kids at this point and I I wouldn't say that I was all over the place but you know I was just like a, a fresh 20 something year old and <laughs> kind of living a different lifestyle and I just remember I didn't uh, dropped out of school or college not high school but I dropped out of college for a little bit and I just remember my dad that's where the tough love came in and he's like you know what you've always been smart and I think that you are going to get back into school and you're going to do what your heart has always wanted to do he was like I'm not going to tell you that what you're doing right now is wrong but he's like I just want you to know that like you're better than the choices that you're making pretty much. And he was right. Amy Cobb will soon be a registered nurse. She's graduating soon with a Bachelor of Science in Nursing. We'll be right back after this. Hi, I'm reporter Trisha Tarinskis. If you want more true crime stories from the upper Midwest, be sure to check out The Vault, where you'll find a podcast hosted by me. You'll also find a treasure trove of archival photos, video, and interviews to help bring the mayhem and mysteries to life. Find The Vault at inforum.com slash the vault. Here is RJR employee Ben Pace again. Lois was like the Southern Belle ray of sunshine, um, like mama figure. We called her Mama Lolo. Lois was just one of those people where you'd run to on the Monday morning and tell her everything that happened and giggle with her. And she would either scold you or giggle. Very much a motherly scolding. Benjamin, why would you do that? She was one of those people that you just couldn't wait to be around. I always think of uh, her singing, You Are My Sunshine, through the office, and her cackle. And here is Lois' daughter, Brianne. I'm 29 years old. I have three kids, um, two girls and a boy. 
I am currently employed at the YMCA in, in their daycare facility, um, which I absolutely love. I love working with kids. Um, my goal is to one day be a preschool teacher. I have so many memories with my mom. She was always such a big part of my life. Brianne started gymnastics at an early age. She began competing at the age of five. And I ended up qualifying for the competitive team. And my mom always supported me through that. She went to almost every single meet that she possibly could. She was always there for all my state and my nationals. She was very supportive. She loved us. We grew up in Girard, um, which is a very small town south of Springfield, Illinois. Um, we lived there. Um, I lived there my whole life. My mom and um, my stepdad, Bill, decided to move when I was 14. And that's when they came to Springfield. My mom grew up in Irmo, South Carolina. She grew up on farmland. She would skip school some days to help out on the farm, um, her and her sister. They would um, help their grandpa, grandfather with the tractors. They had a huge piece of land with several houses on it, like, like probably hundreds of acres of land. And they would go fishing and swim in the ponds. But the one story that I I remember of my mom telling was her and her sister and her cousins used to roll down a really big hill in a tire, like a big tractor tire. They would, put, they would squeeze their bodies in it and one of them would roll them down the hill and they would just go crazy. I asked Brianne if she had any idea of what kind of teenage life her mom had had. As far as I knew, my mom was kind of boring. She just was a farm girl her forever until she turned, um, I think she was, she had just turned 18 and she met my dad and my dad was from Illinois and he, they had a summer together and um, they, uh, my dad went back home to Illinois and couldn't stop thinking about my mom, so he called her and asked her to marry him. And she, at 18 years old, left home and came to Illinois, and um, they, mar- they got married in July of 93. She loved her kids. We were all for her priority. She absolutely loved her grandchildren. She loved being a grandma. Um, she, when she wasn't spending time with her kids, she was working so that she could make memories with us. When she moved to North Dakota, we would call often. You could, you just, you just knew that she loved her babies and it didn't matter whether they were step babies, full blood babies, grand babies, adult babies. She loved all of us so much. This is Amy Cobb again, Bill's daughter, so Lois Cobb's stepdaughter. My parents had separated, and then when my my dad and my stepmom got together, um, I would say, honestly, at first, my relationship with Lois was a little rocky, but that's because I was a teenage girl. Um, But I grew to love her. I mean, I, I talked to her when I, when I would call my dad and talk to him, I would call and talk to her. I had conversations with her just as often as I did him. Um, she, one thing that I, every time I think of her, I just, her love for like cooking, baking. I mean, she was always, I feel like in the kitchen doing something. (laughs) She, uh, she grew up in the South. So she, I feel like that was that was her way to people's hearts. She always cooked people food, always baked stuff. I mean, when I lived with them in Girard for a little bit when I was younger, they, um, they were very big on like responsibilities and chores and stuff. So I remember, uh, she was like, no, you guys are going to learn, like you need to have respect for people and you're going to learn how to do these things. And it was definitely something that both me and my sister, we, we needed that at that time in our lives. So, um, but she was a great person. She, 
was always kind to everyone. Um, I she was never mean to me by any means. Uh, even probably when she should have been, because I was not the nicest as a teenager. But she she handled me with grace for sure. And Lois' daughter Brienne again. She was very fun, very outgoing. Always, almost always had a smile on her face. A lot of a lot of people liked her, but there, if you did get on her bad side, you would know. Um, she was not afraid to stand her ground or to tell you how she felt about you or the situation that is um, going on. She was always always joking, always laughing. Uh, her her and my stepdad told many jokes, and they both thought they were so funny. Like, I don't think I ever heard them complain about anyone they worked with. And I don't know about you, but I've definitely worked at places that we could all probably pick out people that we could complain about. But I don't ever remember hearing them complain about any. Like, they loved everyone that they worked with. They loved their jobs. I just remember her, one of my last conversations with her and her just saying, um, just like how happy she was with her life and like her and my dad together and just like, I don't want to make it sound like their lives were super rough by any means, but just they both obviously went through things. They had prior marriages and obviously children and things like that. And so I just remember her in a simple way saying like how happy she was and like how for once in her life, like she was just so happy to like feel the love that she felt with my dad. I asked Brienne if she had any specific memories of conversations with her mother, Lois. Anything that stands out to her to this day? Um, I I have two of them that I'm thinking of, and um, they're not from my childhood. They're from my children's childhood. Um, When my son was nine months old, uh, we flew to North Dakota to visit, and um, they both instantly fell in love with him. And before we, we were there for about two weeks. And before we left, my mom had taught my son Jensen how to walk. She was so proud of that. And it was, so, it was such a beautiful moment to watch her be a grandma. And her second memory? When I was in labor with my daughter, I was rushing to the hospital um, and I was texting her the whole way there and she was trying to calm me down because I was in full panic and in full-blown labor. I made it to the hospital 1101. I delivered my daughter at 1102 and I called my mom as they were still helping the baby and helping me And I told her that I gave my daughter her middle name and it was, she started crying and it was just such a proud moment. I could hear it in her voice and it felt so good. She just cherished being a grandma. After the murders at RJR, Bill and Lois families traveled to North Dakota. There was a whirlwind of activity for days and days and days. They had meetings with law enforcement, and of course there were funeral arrangements to be made too. The murders at RJR occurred on April 1st, 2019. Just some four months earlier, Bill and Lois had purchased a new home, their dream home. The purchase was so new that when their loved ones did come to North Dakota after the murders, they'd never seen the home before. Amy Cobb remembers seeing it for the first time. This beautiful country house. <laughs> and it felt like it was literally in the middle of nowhere because it was. <laughs> and um, But I just remember walking in the door and it was like... I think that was probably the hardest for all of us, honestly, was walking in the door and just seeing like their half-drink coffee or like first we were just taking in like their new house you know like they were so excited about moving there they had just moved there in like December so they hadn't even lived there a full four months at this point and 
I just remember like when we went in their room, um, like <laughs> my mom's side of the bed, she had like her pajamas like nicely folded and put on her nightstand. And then like my dad's side just had like his pajamas on the floor and like his water from the night before and like a candy wrapper. And like, it was just like the normal, like, you know, your day to day things that you don't think of because you think you're coming home. I felt like that was probably the saddest part of actually going to North Dakota besides dealing with the, yeah, the meetings, the detectives and the funeral home and just all of that. I asked Brianne and Amy what they missed most about their parents and also what would they say to them now if they could? Honestly, I think about this often. I do talk to my dad pretty often, actually. Um, not to sound crazy. I, I go out to their gravesite and talk to them, and, or I just sit at home and talk to them. Um, honestly, I feel like a big portion that I would talk to, honestly, both of them is just um, how much more I understand now that I have kids of my own. I miss our phone calls she would call me I would call her and sometimes we would talk for five minutes and sometimes we would talk for hours and it didn't matter what time of day it was we always answered each other's phone calls um I would probably talk to him about nursing school because it pretty much consumes my life besides having children (laughs) so um I don't know. I honestly think about it all the time, like what I would talk to them about. And I just feel like some of it's just like the day to day stuff. Like I see something that makes me think of him and I'm like, oh, my dad would love that. Or, oh, my God, my dad would think that person's stupid. (laughs) Like just so many things. She would send me goofy text messages and I would Snapchat her pictures and videos of my kids and we would FaceTime and just laugh and I miss her laugh. I miss her laugh so much. I don't think that there's anything I could say to her if I had the opportunity. I just want to hear her laugh. I miss that laugh. It was so funny and so contagious. If she started laughing, everybody in the room was gonna laugh. I don't know that it would be limited to just one thing or another. I think it would just be a combination of like my life currently and There's certain times that um, I need a little bit more tough love. And that was, my dad was that person for that. I don't know. I feel like the conversation would probably never end. We'll be right back with some more words from Amy and Brianne after this. If you're enjoying this episode of Dakota Spotlight, be sure to check out the full lineup of Forum Communications podcasts at inforum.com slash podcasts. We have true crime, sports, politics, and plenty of news to keep you in the know and up to date. Visit inforum.com slash podcasts to learn more. In this final segment, before I play for you the full audio from the medley of Bill Cobb's Elvis Presley video, I've asked Amy and Brianne to share with us how they coped or attempted to cope with all of this, both in the beginning, but even how are things going for them today? I also asked them if they had any advice or words of wisdom for others who might have to go through something like this. Here is Brienne again. That day plays over in my head more often than I wish. Brienne told me she went to a grievance counselor the day after she learned her parents had been murdered. She cried so hard and so continuously that she finally vomited. It was just, I'd been crying so much, I couldn't stop, I couldn't catch my breath. And as I think we probably all know, even if it sometimes feels better to throw up, no matter why that is happening, 
Brianne's journey into dealing with this horrific murder of her parents was just beginning. Um, I was diagnosed with PTSD because I could, I, for the longest time, I couldn't go inside buildings. I couldn't go to work. I couldn't leave my kids. Um, I'm getting there. I'm slowly getting there. I'm just working on being out in public again and just kind of trying to get back to my life. It's been four years and I'm still damaged from that day. And Amy Cobb. Definitely this entire tragedy changed my perspective on life completely. And some days I'm thankful for it. Some days it makes me angry. I don't like to leave my house in a a messy manner because I do like sometimes have a fear. What if I don't come home? You know, like things happen all the time. And obviously I'm well aware of that. It's now I don't know. I don't feel like I've ever really been a mean person, but I definitely feel like I pay more attention to what I say to people or like how I say things to people because I think about like, what if that's the last time I talk to them? Oh, tomorrow will be too late. It's now or never. Sometimes I feel like that sucks. <laughs> In a simple way, it sucks to feel that way because, in a way, it, like, robs me of living in the moment. But it does make me more aware of things. Like, the last time I talked to my parents before, I talked to them the Saturday before they were killed, you know? Like, and so, like, that conversation, I think about that all the time. And what advice or words of wisdom do these two young, brave women have for others who might have to go through something like this. Don't hold back on the emotions. Let them go. Let them do what they're going to do. The more you hide how you feel, the harder it's going to be. I was in denial a lot. And once I finally let my emotions go, it was so much easier to accept everything, to understand, to clear my mind, and to take in what had really happened. And Amy Cobb. I would probably say (laughs) just rely on your people. Like you're going to have people who are there for you and you're going to feel like you're a burden, but you're not. Yeah. I would just say, you know, let, let people help you out while you're in this dark moment. Another thing is, in the moment and you like the shock takes a while to wear off but like you still want to try to feel the emotions because um for a while i tried not to they passed away in april and i found out i was pregnant in june so while i was first finding out i was pregnant i felt like i couldn't feel stress or be like have any emotions or anything like that because i was scared that i would like lose my baby So I would just say, you know, like, it's okay to go to therapy. It's okay to talk to people. It's also okay to not talk to people. We had a lot of people that reached out to us for a long time. And sometimes I felt guilty to not want to, but you have to like, you have to take care of yourself and you have to allow people to help you take care of yourself. I would also say that it doesn't get easier You just get used to it. And with that, time will heal. As far as the other families involved, kind of, I just wanted to say to them, because I feel like we all kind of used to be more in contact than we are now, um, just because, you know, life happens. And But, like, I just want them to know that I do think about them every day. And that I am really thankful for all that they've done for all of us. Um... I'm just, I don't really know. Just my heart is with them um, because we all went through the same situation, but we're all like different perspectives as daughters and sons and wives and things like that. I just, just wanted to say that my heart is with them and that I do think about them every day. We all came together and we were all there for each other and supported each other. And we all helped each other get through this. And we still do. 
We all still communicate, even if it's not as often as we were. Um, we all check in on each other and we make sure we're okay. And we share memories with each other and pictures and videos. And it's really beautiful how we all did come together. Bill and Lois Cobb may no longer walk this earth as physical beings, as humans amongst us, but it's certainly clear that their spirit lives on in the lives of their loved ones. Or, as Brianne pointed out to me, maybe the spirit of Lois and the spirit of Bill are found elsewhere, too. You can find them in a song, you can find them in a color, you can find them in the trees, or the way the wind just blows and you can just feel their soul around you. It's I'm a very spiritual person, and I truly, truly believe that their spirit lives on, and it could live on in animals, it can live on in nature, it can live on in, in music, and in all kinds of stuff. Who knows? Maybe in the music of Elvis Presley. I'm going to leave you with the audio from Bill Cobb's medley of Elvis songs. If you'd like to see this video, head over to inforum.com slash mandanmurders. I'm James Wallner. Thank you so much for listening to my podcast. I'll see you next time. It's now or never Come hold me tight Kiss me, my darling Be mine tonight Oh, tomorrow Will be too late It's now or never My love won't be Show. A three to get ready now. Go, okay, go, but don't you sell my blue sleeve shoes. We well, can do anything but lay on my blue sleeve shoes. You can knock me down, stand on my face, sign my name all over the place. Baby, let me be a loving teddy bear. Put a chain around my neck Leave me here with Let me be Well, I will be Your teddy bear Let me be Never Let me go You have me My life ran a complete and I love you so. Well, I was a new Orleans, but I never know what's a bunny ever breeze. So give a bit of a damn word. Let it come to boy, never done it be good. Never ever let it be a man so well. He can play the guitar just like a regular girl. Go, go. Go, Johnny, go, go. Go, Johnny, go.
So long to mess around with me. Take it, play some hard for me. Oh, but I can't. 